Hi, my name is Hank Preston. I'm one of the developer evangelists with Cisco DevNet, and thank you for joining me on today's video training session. What we're going to do is we're going to look at exactly what a developer environment is and why you might want one or need one, what tools go into them, and, and what purpose those different tools provide. What exactly is a development environment, and why do you need one? Well, today, these days, many people are leveraging a computer to do their job. This is true whether those people are inside or outside of official IT. In the medical field, doctors, nurses, and technicians use computers to access the medical records and diagnostic software packages installed and configured so they can do their job. If you're in the financial industry, you have terminals set up with software for tracking the markets and making trades. And graphic designers and artists are using digital software tools to actually do their artistic renderings that are out there. The specific configurations and setups that individuals use to do their jobs is called their environment. A development environment is the collection of software, tools, and resources that a developer leverages to do their job. Today, more and more people are beginning to embrace elements of programmability and development as part of their job. This is whether or not they're doing specific software development as their primary role, or maybe they're infrastructure engineers starting to bring in DevOps practices for managing their, so or their systems, their network, their security, all over the place. In these cases, each of these engineers are looking for the need to have their own development environment where they can explore all the APIs available, write different scripts and automation routines, or build integrations as they go through. Now, these development environments can be local, hosted, or cloud-based. A local development environment is an environment where we install and configure all of the software and tools directly on your own workstation. This provides a high degree of customization and personalization for each developer's choice. You can figure out exactly how you want to work because everything's installed locally on your own workstation. It also gives us a very highly portable option that we can take with us on the go. Now a hosted development environment, rather than installing all of those tools and software directly on your own workstation, we leverage a virtual machine. This could be a shared or dedicated virtual machine from a different hosting provider where all these tools can be installed and made available. Developers would then use a remote access technology, such as remote desktop or SSH, to connect to the hosted environment to do their development. Now, a special kind of hosted environment would be a cloud development environment. This is where the developers actually access the tools from within a web application rather than through like an RDP or SSH connection. Now, now that we have the hosted, local, and cloud-based development explanations underway, Let's figure out what you need in your own development environment to get started. As we're talking about running software, we need to have some sort of an operating system to go through. The good news is that today, the latest versions of Windows, Linux, and Mac OS can all be used as the foundation for a very usable and productive development environment. You don't have to feel limited to one platform or another. Now, the next piece we want to go through is source control. If you're, developing, uh, if you're building yourself a development environment, it's safe to say that you're going to be working with code of some format. And whether that code is for web applications, mobile apps, scripts, or really anything else, you're going to need a place to store, track, and share that code. And while you could store your code in local or shared folders or a cloud drive or even a flash USB key, managing versions manually in these types of areas with folder names or file names that end in version 12, version 13, my version, and so on, well, that's really not practical as a, when you're going to be doing development at scale. Therefore, one of the first tools you want to become familiar with is a source control or version control platform. Source control systems like Git or Subversion are a core part of the software development workflow. These systems provide a robust document management capabilities, allowing software developers to easily work with their code revisions, uh, easily work with your code and save revisions, which we'll call commits, explore potential possibilities in isolated environments, we call those branches, and combine the work from multiple developers or work streams by merging code together. Now, while many graphical interfaces and applications are available for developers to use today, these that are aiming at increasing developer productivity by providing an easy to use and powerful platform for developing the code, as a developer, you're going to need a command line terminal to run the code and interact with the services and systems underlying your applications. Also, many times the most productive tools that you can use as a developer are built as command line tools. 
A shell is a command line user interface for interacting with your computer. Shells have been around for the entire modern computing age, and there are many different options available for you to use across different operating systems. A couple of examples include Bash, or the Born Again shell. This is a common shell for Unix or Linux based operating systems, including Mac OS. Command.exe or cmd.exe is the native command line interpreter for Windows systems. And PowerShell is a combination shell and scripting framework that Microsoft developed originally just for their Windows platform, but has recently been open sourced and made available across platforms. The next piece we want to look at are programming languages. The programming language provides the words, syntax, and rules that developers use to build their applications. This is the code that is written, is written in one of these programming languages. Over the years, there have been countless, well not countless, but lots and lots of programming languages created. And typically, an individual language is designed for a specific type of application or use, which means that it's very unlikely we'll ever find one programming language to rule them all in Lord of the Rings fashion. Depending on the language you plan to write your code in, you're going to need to install different components on your development workstation. Some examples include a compiler. A software compiler translates the code that you wrote in the programming language to some target language or format that can actually be executed by the computer. The output of a compiler is often referred to as machine code or assembly. This is a low, these are the low-level instructions optimized for execution by the computer processors. Once compiled, users of the application don't require a compiler themselves on their own system. C++ and Go are two examples of languages that require a compiler to work with. Now, some computer languages are not designed to be compiled, rather they're designed to be interpreted. In these cases, a software interpreter is used. With interpreted languages, both the developer as well as the user of the application requires the interpreter to be installed on their workstations. Python is an example of a popular interpreted language today. Now there are also software development kits, often referred to as SDKs. SDKs are packages of software development tools installed by developers to provide access to the utilities and resources necessary to work and create language applications in a particular programming language. These SDKs may be specific to a language, an environment, or some sort of a platform you're working with. SDKs are only needed by the software developer to create an application. Users of the application wouldn't need the SDK. As an example, Java developers would use the Java SDK when building an application, but an end user wouldn't need the SDK and simply just needs the Java runtime installed to work with the applications. Now an application's code is typically a collection of text files and the act of coding involves writing and editing those text files. This means one of the most used software development tools is a program that you would work with these text files. Generically, we'll call this a text editor. Now the features that make a good developer's text editor are very different from the features that make a good word processing program for writing papers or publication documents. The code of an application is either going to be compiled or interpreted by another software application that process the raw characters, pre pre uh, raw characters present in the file. This means that the co your code must be clear of any hidden formatting characters that are leveraged by a lot of different word processing systems to indicate punctuation, bolding, and formatting areas. Many programs used to write documents for human consumption work in formats like rich text format, RTF, or specific proprietary formats like the Microsoft Word doc format. These formats manipulate the entered text by, with these punctuation and hidden characters to change the, the output to be more visually pleasing, again, for a human consumer. Now, we don't want to embed these types of hidden formatting instructions inside of our code because that would actually make them not functioning and maybe behave in a way that we wouldn't expect. This means that the first rule for a good developer's text editor is that it needs to work in raw text. Now, while making code look nice is irrelevant for the function of the code, it can be really quite helpful for a developer as you work to have keywords highlighted in different colors, syntax errors automatically defined and highlighted, as well as common programming elements suggested or auto-completed while you're working. 
Developer-friendly text editors often have language processors and styling built in so that as you're working, it automatically provides these types of pieces. Sometimes the developer's text editor includes features beyond just text editing. Perhaps it also integrates source control systems to make checking in your code easier. Or maybe it includes a shell interface that you can directly run and execute your code, or ties in with other different types of tools. In these cases, those development text editors often move from being a simple text editor to something that's called an IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. IDEs are these robust applications that attempt to provide everything the developer needs within a single application. Now, a developer's job is more than just writing code. They also need to explore the different APIs that are consumed within their code, and they need to test their own application as they write it. And as many applications are written today for consumption through a web browser, you need tools to verify and troubleshoot web applications. There are countless, well, once again, they're not countless, but it'd be really hard to count them all, options for developer tools to solve these types of needs. Often the ones that you're used are going to change depending on the exact type of application and language you're working in. This brings us to an application container engine. Developers have always, had fa have always faced the challenge of how to package up and provide your application to the users that will need to, it or, or need to use it or want to use it. Many methods and options have been developed and used over the years, and today a very common mechanism is to deliver applications in containers. Now put simply, an application container is a packaging method where the application code and any dependencies are combined together in an efficient format that can be easily run in an isolated environment from other containers on some type of host platform. Now let's break down the key elements of that description and definition. First, dependencies. Developers rarely write every bit of code that makes up their application. More often, they leverage code or even other applications written by other developers. Examples of this include something as simple as importing a module or library into your code to simplify a complex task like time and date manipulation, to web developers needing a web server to actually host their web application. Everything an application needs outside of the code that the developer themselves actually writes is considered a dependency. And we talk about efficiency. Virtual machines have long been used by companies to run applications in a more efficient method than having an independent physical server for every single application. The move to VMs was a step in the direction for efficiency, but a VM includes far more resources and information than an application actually needs to run. A container provides a significant improvement in this efficiency space by including only the elements necessary to run the actual application. Now regarding isolation, when running, each application should be contained within its own execution space and not have access to or be impacted by other applications that are running. The reasons for this include security concerns as well as stability and conflict isolation. And then finally, host platform. Like virtual machines, containers must be executed on some type of a host platform. A single host platform should be able to run many containers simultaneously, each in an isolated environment. Now that we've gone through some of the characteristics and the categories of the types of things you will put into your development environment, you may wonder, what are some great tool choices to start with? Now, it's important to remember that this list we're going to go through is not intended to say that these are the tools that you should use, or even the tools that you necessarily want to use. This is rather intended to provide a basic starting point for engineers looking for one. The tools chosen in this list represent op options that are common, simple, and available as either open source or free solutions across all the different platforms that we're looking at. If you've already begun working as a developer or toying with different development and you have a tool that meets your needs successfully that's not included in this list, that's great. Please continue to use it. Always remember the great software development advice from Aristotle. The best text editor is the one that you already know how to use. Now the later labs in this module are going to walk through on how to install each of these tools on your Windows, Mac, or Linux workstation but let's talk about them a little bit here. Now, as I already mentioned, thankfully today, you can be successful no matter which of the three operating systems you choose, Windows, Mac, or Linux. 
Not that long ago, it was the case that it was good advice to pick the operating system for development that matched the operating system you were developing for. But with the advances in tooling and capabilities that operating systems and developers are having, we have much more freedom. Now, one caveat to this is that it's highly suggested to be on the latest version of the operating system, particularly for Windows users. While Windows 10 provides a solid foundation of the capabilities you need as a software developer working potentially in a Linux development environment, you may be more challenged if you're on older versions of Windows and want to look at other alternatives that are there. Now, starting with source control systems, while there are several popular source control systems avail available, if you're just getting started, Git is a great choice to begin with. This is particularly due to the popularity of GitHub. Git has become one of the most commonly used source control systems in the development world today, and by installing and becoming familiar with Git, you'll be able to quickly participate in the large and growing community of developers. Furthermore, all of the sample code and resources available from Cisco DevNet are hosted in Git repos, and you're going to need it installed to easily consume those resources. Next, regarding terminals and shells. While Bash is the default interpreter and CLI for Unix and Linux and Mac OS systems, it is also available today in several forms for use on a Windows operating system. By installing and leveraging Bash on Windows, it will be much easier for developers using a Windows-based environment to replicate and leverage code samples, tutorials, and lessons found online. And in the following lab on installing and setting up a Windows environment, we'll be seeing how we can leverage the Git Bash shell that's included with Git for Windows. Now the programming languages that you want to install and set up will depend explicitly on the which languages you plan to write your, write your applications in. If you're just getting started and not sure exactly which ones you're going to be using, a couple of great examples are Python and Node.js. Python is an interpreted programming language that's become quite popular. It is very simple to learn, but also offers a very powerful syntax and feature set. Particularly for infrastructure engineers, Python has become the de facto language of choice. Node.js is a JavaScript runtime that is very popular for developers because of the JavaScript foundation, and it provides a consistent language across web, sometimes referred to as front-end development, as well as back-end development, which would be the applications that run on the server side. Now, few aspects of the development environment tooling choice will be as potentially opinionated and personal as the text editor and IDEs. And as you do more development and coding, you will likely test out and use a variety of different text editors and IDEs at any point in time. Now that said, if you have a preferred tool choice already, feel free to continue leveraging it. However, if you are just getting started with coding and are looking for a suggestion on something to use, or maybe you're in the market for a new text editor, a great option to look at is Atom. Atom is an open source text editor available for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows that provides many of the powerful features and plugins that you can explore, and it makes it almost akin to an IDE rather than just a basic text editor. Now, like the choice of programming languages, the choice of the types of development tools and clients that you need will depend heavily on the type of applications and coding you plan to do. The types of tools and clients will vary as you go forward with different types of projects. However, here's a few suggestions to get you started as you're setting up your environment. Postman. Postman is a powerful REST API client that provides a host of capabilities for testing, exploring, and writing REST APIs. Postman offers both a free and paid option. However, the free option is often quite capable for most beginning developers. Now, ngrok. Many times, the applications and scripts that you write as a developer may be intended to be deployed to the public internet and made available to external users to access via some sort of a web interface or REST API. For example, let's say you're writing a chat bot. Well, your bot needs to be reachable from the chat service that is often cloud-based. During the development phase, you want to run that code locally for your bot on your development environment to test that it's working as you expect it before you deploy it to the production system. To be effective, you need a way to expose the running code on your workstation to the public internet for external services to connect to it. Putting your development workstation directly on the internet is often not possible or practical. This is where ngrok comes in. 
NGROC is one of several possible tools that aims to solve this specific problem for developers. It's an application you run on your environment, and it builds a connection path from the public internet to your local workstation, starting from your local workstation. It's initiated inside of firewalls, proxies, and NAT, which makes it very easy to work with in this type of a framework. Google Chrome, right? You likely already have a preferred web browser, or maybe you use multiple browsers to access the web and browse sites. As you begin to use the web as a developer, you're gonna find yourself using browsers in ways other than typical research or social media interaction. You may want to test the compatibility of your application across browsers and form factors, explore HTTP calls that are being generated by your browsers, or even debug the JavaScript that's running within the web client. Google Chrome provides a robust set of developer tools that peel back the curtain on how the HTTP process is working. Now, while not strictly a developer tool, a VPN client can be quite helpful to install in your environment if you plan to work with some of the different DevNet sandboxes that are offered for accessing hardware and software platforms for testing and coding against. Cisco AnyConnect is a popular VPN client that many enterprises are already using, and if you have it installed, you can use it to connect to DevNet sandboxes today. If you don't have any connect, you can also use the open source alternative OpenConnect to connect to these different types of DevNet sandbox VPNs. Now when we talk about container engines, Docker is not the only application container engine, and it wasn't even the first, but it is definitely the most popular one in use today. And unless your organization or specific use case requires another option, such as the native Linux container, often called LXC, Docker is a great one to start with.